I'm Ray Kinsler. Uh, I've been a FIDO developer for the last three or four years. And then prior to that, I was working on DPDK for the previous six or seven years. Uh, I worked on DPDK uh, before it was called DPDK, before it indeed had any name at all. And uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about what it is we're doing to enable cloud enable uh, VPP and DPDK. Now, what do I mean by that? Because it's kind of a bit of a nebulous term. What does cloud enabling mean? Well, I guess I'm talking about um, making both of those, VPP and DPDK, more conducive to working in the cloud environment and the kind of work and activities that have been happening. OK. Oh, ah, there we go. Legal disclaimers, and there's who I am. I already talked about that. OK. So um, before I move on, I just want to comment on the last Prezo. And just, uh, is anybody who gets up here and can do a demo like that and not have it fall on its ass, I just, I do, I just think that's legend. Uh, any demo I've ever done standing on stage has inevitably seg faulted, caught fire, exploded, so way. I just thought that was absolutely kick-ass. So I don't know, I think he's left the room. But anyway, yeah, much kudos on the, to the last presenter. So um, let me move on. OK, so I guess the network is changing. When, back when I started working on networking for Intel, uh, network functions were, were always uh, kind of discrete appliances, mostly with ASICs and then sometimes software-defined um, what's happened since then is that we've seen a, a kind of a revolution in how network functions are, and I mean data plane network functions, how na data plane network functions are being built. And that is, you know, things have moved from being purely expressed in ASICs to being software defined on discrete appliances. And then those soft discrete appliances got turned into virtual network functions. And those virtual network functions are becoming cloud native network functions, and that's part of what we're here today talking about. What's happening underneath is that the actual application software, you know, since became, since being deployed in the discrete appliance, really hasn't changed all that much from being, this, you know, being on a discrete appliance to a virtual network function to a cloud native, you know, or a, to a, um, to a cloud network function. So we are having to do some work, and there's many, there, there's some good reasons why that has happened, and I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. But what it, the, basically the message I wanted to give you on this slide was that even though deployment has changed, application architecture hasn't necessarily changed yet. So what I'm gonna talk about in a moment is the kind of changes that we're bringing to DPDK and VPP to make it more conducive to working in a cloud native way. Oh, there we go. So by a show of hands, who's heard of DPDK before? Okay, right. And I presume everybody's heard of Fido before. <laughs> They're all sitting in the room. That's it. So I gotta make a long, to make a long story short on this slide, um, for years we worked on DPDK and we had a ton of sample code. And we always kind of uh, looked at the stars and said, gee, wouldn't it be great to have a network stack to run on DPDK? Wouldn't that be just fabulous? Because we had sample code for IPv4, we had sample code for uh, we had sample code for L2, we had sample code for vhost, I authored a bit of it myself, and we had sample code for this and that, but we didn't have anything, we didn't have a, a fully featured network, we didn't have a fully featured network stack, and there was a fully featured network stack available from a few different vendors. So when FIDO was open sourced back in 2015, 2016, it was a gift. It was what DPDK had been missing for years. It was, a network stack that was built with all of the same optimizations as DPDK and was really, really a lot of what we were looking for. So we were delighted that Intel when FIDO was open sourced. And that's kind of where, how I would differentiate the two different use cases. You know, we, 
give DPDK for greenfield developments. If you're looking to build your own network stack from the grounds up, and um, you know, we, you know, we offer DPDK, and that's a great place to start. If you're looking to start with an absolute ton of existing code, you know, that's where we offer FIDO VPP. And um, you know, the great story is the two things work great together. You know, DPDK is not aiming to integrate with Kubernetes or OpenStack directly. It, does, it achieves that through talking through FIDO VPP. So, I guess, the, the, why do we engineer DPDK the way we did? Performance, essentially. You know, DPDK makes, assumption, makes strong assumptions or made strong assumptions about owning all the network card. It made strong assumptions about owning large tracts of memory. And it made strong assumptions about using all the CPU it was given. So going all the way back to those, mon those discrete appliances that I talked about when they became software-defined, when DPDK was running on a software-defined discrete appliance, it owned all the NICs on the system anyway. It owned all the CPUs in the system anyway. It owned all the memory on the system anyway. So, and it did this for performance reasons. You know, it, may, it made, it, it, it ran in pole mode in the CPU to avoid context switches, because context switches are prohibitively expensive. It used huge pages to avoid TLB misses, because TLB misses are prohibitively expensive. And it also, it owned the entire NIC, because sharing a NIC with somebody else is, you know, you can end up with things like, uh, you can end up in indeterminism in the system. So DPDK owned the whole, owned the whole NIC. So we designed DPDK to, be like, to support monolithic applications and to be very deterministic in, how, in realizing extremely fast performance. But times have changed. We're no longer being deployed in discrete appliances. We then moved into being deployed on VNFs, and we had to work very hard with virtual network functions to offer the same kind of determinism. And now, as we move towards cloud-native, cloud-ready models, we have to find ways to offer the same level as performance, but to do a little bit better on sharing. And that's what we're going to talk to, talk to in a moment. So inevitably, things break down three ways. I talk about CPU sharing, I.O. sharing, and memory sharing. So one of the things that we've done recently was we worked, reworked the DPDK memory subsystem so that DPDK allocated memory on demand. Gee, there's a novel idea, allocating memory on demand. But that's essentially what was done. So instead of, offer, instead of um, allocating huge amounts of uh, large tracts of huge pages, as we would have done in the past. Now what we do is we allocate huge pages as they're actually required. So this drastically reduces the memory footprint for the, uh, most DPDK-based applications. And there's more like this coming in, uh, as we do further work to optimize and make more lightweight the DPDK memory subsystem. We also uh, offer an enhancement now to Intel's uh, range of 40 gig NICs called Fortville. Uh, what, you know, in an age where your, your network is resplendent with overlay protocols, one thing that you'll need, you typically need to be able to do is balance I.O. across multiple receive queues and across multiple virtual functions as you disaggregate your monolithic network appliance. And that's something that we enable now with Fortville. We can go dive into the packet, we can see overlay protocols, and we can you know, load balance on the outer header, we can load balance on the inner header as required. And then finally, we coming into more light mate uh, I.O. options. So previously, your only way to disaggregate I.O. was to allocate virtual functions. We're moving beyond that now, and we're offering a technology called VDPA. And what VDPA offers is the ability to separate the control plane and the data plane of the network card such that you essentially end up with an RX and TX queue uh, per virtual interface. So it's a DBDPA is a for pure virtual interface that offers a, or that offers virtio sorry it offers virtual function speeds, but it does, you don't end up having to allocate a, a, at virtual function granularity. So typically NICs live typically NICs live. Um, uh, Intel NICs and, and, uh, limits you to 64 or 128 virtual functions. 
but our NICs also support upwards of uh, 1.5K device per queues. So by, no long, by moving away from virtual functions and by act, creating a virtual interface that wraps the NICs device per queue, you can have a very lightweight interface that you can allocate into containers as you require, but gives you very, very, very fast performance but also doesn't have that kind of, that, 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 that very, you know, that scaling story around virtual, uh, the SRIOV, that vir around virtual functions. So those are just three things that we've done recently in DPDK to make it more lightweight. We've given it a way to use memory more optimally. We've given it a way to, um, a, a, and ways to be more lightweight in I.O. So we'll move on to FIDO VPP. We've done similar work in FIDO VPP, and I have to give a lot of credit to Damien Marion, who's not in the room at the moment, but he's, Damien has done a lot, most of this work. So, um, you know, like DPDK, before, you know, undertaking this work, FIDO VPP had the same kind of characteristics in that it pulled all the time, it consumed all the cores it was given. So what we have done is we have moved to more recent models where you can shift between pure polling mode and interrupt-driven mode based on the relative traffic at the time. If you're in a, and if you're in a peak scenario, you may want to poll, you know, if it's, a, it's, your, it's your peak traffic time. But if it's in the middle of the night and you're not seeing very much traffic, you might want to shift back to interrupt mode and save power. And we offer both the ability to shift from interrupt mode back to poll mode at runtime. You don't need to restart if the FIDO VPP. This is a runtime configuration shifting between the modes. But then if you want VPP to be responsive to the traffic conditions, you can also set hybrid mode or adaptive mode in which VPP will make a decision at runtime and in real time whether it needs to be polling or it needs to be in the, or it can more optimally run, run in interrupt driven mode and it shift between the two states uh, on demand. So this gives you the, this gives you the ability to, um, this get to respond to net network conditions. There's something else is you can also reallocate RX and TX queues between cores. So if you want to put a core into essentially into idle mode, i.e. I'm not wanting to use that core, I want to scale down the number of cores that I'm using, you can reallocate the RX and TX queues to a single core. So move all the servicing of all the RX and TX queues you've allocated on your NIC down to a single core. Or if you're in the back into a peak traffic scenario, you can reallocate those RX and TX queues back to one of the worker cores at runtime. Now a worker core that has, is not servicing an RX and TX queue has essentially nothing to do. So that core can be reused for something else. But so you, in this way, you have the ability to scale out FIDO VPP at runtime based on traffic conditions by shifting it shifting around the RX and TX queues between cores and then shifting those cores between polling and adapt adaptive mode and uh, interrupt driven mode. Something else that we've added recently into FIDO VPP is asymmetry. You know, uh, previously FIDO, the way FIDO VPP was built was that it always assumed it made, uh, you ran the same graph nodes across all cores, and then you typically had something doing load balancing between those cores under the hood, something like RSS. So what's changed is that we've introduced technologies into FIDO VPP to allow FIDO VPP to have asymmetry, to run one pipeline on one core and another pipeline on another core. And this tends to lend itself very well to kind of tunneling scenarios where you might do an in cap on one core and then route the packet out to the wire on the other core. Or you might want to do a natting on one core and then route the packet out to another core. You might want to do IPsec encapsulation on one core and then route the packet to ACLs or something out another core. And that technology is called ha handoff, and it allows you to break the packet processing pipeline at a halfway point or the point that you deem, and then to load balance, or sorry, to hand off the packet between cores. So it allows you to scale FIDO VPP out, the packet, the packet pipeline of FIDO VPP out across multiple cores. 
Something else we've also added support for is the support for the DPDK RTE Flow API. And what the RTE Flow API allows you to do is actually to program uh, the flow director, which is a flow direction technology on the NIC, to direct one kind of flow to one core and then another kind of flow to another core. So you might want to send all your ICMP, all your ARP packets, all your control plane packets to a single, uh, to core zero, and then you might want to send all of your data plane packets like IPv4, IPv6 routing to one cores, one, two, three, four, whatever it is. Is, and uh, RTE Flow API allows you to do that. It allows you to program flow rules down onto the NIC. And again, this is something that we added recently by the VPP. What all of these things allow you to do in concert, whether it's handoff or as other RTE Flow, is it allows you to run different pipelines on different cores and to scale out your packet pipeline. We also added a high performance memory interface to support container to container communication. You know, previously in the age of um, uh, virtualization, we had a ton of guys, myself included, working on technologies like vhost and vertio and figuring out the way to squeeze the last cycle out of those two technologies. But in the age of containers, you know, all, a new virtual interface is required. You know, vertio no longer rules. And to answer the call, Fido VPP created a new technology called the MEMIF interface, which supports both vSwitch and point-to-point -point packet communications. So you can do a traditional vSwitch, vSwitch, vRouter, and use Fido VPP to switch between your containers as a vSwitch or vRouter. But you can also use MEMIF to create, uh, to um, punt packets directly between containers. And I think um, Matchek was talking about this earlier where we talked where we talked about realizing virtual service uh, container of cloud native service change with Fido VPP. Well, MEMIF is a technology that essentially allows you to do that. So it allows you to punt from packet A, sorry, container A to container B, container C, just using a lightweight memory interface, which is libmemif. It also has been highly optimized for the platform itself, making liberal use of vector instructions and uh, vector instructions. And my colleague from ARM was talking about using vector instructions earlier. But libmemif lib makes liberal use of vector instructions to have a very highly optimal way to punt packets between cores. We have also done a lot to make uh, Fido VPP more lightweight itself for infrastructure. So, you know, if you want to have a very lightweight layer four, sorry, layer two, layer three interface, we have libmemif for a layer two, layer three interface. And if you, as just essentially, it's just a lightweight library that you uh, deploy, insert into your VM, uh, sorry, insert into your container, forgive me. And that gives you, gives you a high performance interface back to your, infra, uh, back to your infrastructure. We also have a layer, a layer four and layer seven interface. Which is, um, which is libvcl, and Florin talked about that earlier. Again, it's a lightweight way to put, to, to put stateful communications back to your infrastructure. The infrastructure itself, based on FIDO VPP, you can tune to your memory requirements, and in the way that I talked, uh, you know, as we talked through before, you can make it more lightweight, you can make it use less memory or more memory, you can make that infrastructure scale up or scale down, you can get that infrastructure is more friendly around uh, sharing I.O. So the infrastructure itself has become more lightweight. So the infrastructure is becoming more light and then the ways to talk to that infrastructure themselves are also lightweight. Now, uh, some ongoing challenges. Um, I guess not specifically for FIDO VPP, uh, but um, we're st one of the things that we're still missing is improved ways to share CPU times between processes. You know, one thing that we haven't cracked yet is a way for to continue to get uh, high-performing interfaces in a way that's more, you, more friendly to share CPU time. Certainly the ability to scale up and down uh, core count, you know, is definitely part of the answer to that. But we haven't quite cracked a way to mitigate the cost of a context switch. So that is something that's still being worked on. Uh, we, another, another challenge is you know, user space networking and the, how user space networking has evolved. So back when I started working on um, user space networking, everybody wanted us to make user space networking look like Linux. So this thing, this thing called DPDK is fantastic. It gives you great performance. We want to use DBDK. Now, you, what you need to do is make it look like Linux, and then we'll go use it. You know, we're going to react to take DBDK to look like Linux. 
uh, and you know that wasn't part, you know it wasn't part, certainly wasn't possible at that time. Now, now that DPDK and FIDO VPP have become solid parts of the networking ecosystem, we'd look to other communities such as FO Routing or to Bird or to Coaga or to you know insert the name of your favorite network as your favorite networking software here to become friendlier to user space networking. User space networking is here to stay and interoperability with adjacent communities it, you know, is starting to happen and it's a welcome trend and we need more of it. Um, so finally, I'd say that FIDO VPP are, and uh, DPDK are complementary technologies. Uh, they're certainly becoming cloud native, uh, sorry, certainly becoming more cloud friendly and cloud ready. Um, the reason they were designed for a very, very specific reason, and that is to enable performance, enables you get, you know, kick-ass performance. Uh, but we are finding ways, and we're continuing to evolve ways to make those, uh, to make those applications perform and be more friendly to a cloud, uh, cloud environments and cloud, de cloud deployments. Okay. Cool, and uh, thank you for finishing with plenty of time left, because we have uh, time for a couple questions. So. All right, I will hit the three people who've raised their hand. So go, go here first, all right. No hard questions now. Okay. Ask really hard questions. Hi, uh, you talked about uh, VDPA interface and uh, DVDK. I, I VDPA? I can't quite hear you. Uh, sorry, the VTPA interface, VDPA, yes. yeah. And you talked about the MIM interface and VPP. Yes. Uh, can we not just pick one and use them for both? So, I guess, uh, VDPA is still evolving. Uh, MEMIF is here and ready, ready to use. Um, VDPA is very much targeted for scenarios in which you want to do something. Um, let me explain this. So a lot of Kubernetes deployments that we see are actually deployed inside virtual machines. So you'll end up with rel relatively large virtual machines with uh, Kubernetes deployed inside it and lots of containers in it. And this is what this is a way in which some com, some which some com service providers, some cloud service providers, separate you know uh, separate our Kubernetes deployment from their infrastructure. So in those scenarios, VDPA is, that's where VDPA really shines, which is in which you want to punt a lightweight interfa interface into your virtual machine for use by your containers. If you're in a more bare metal deployment scenario, uh, MEM, you might find MEMIF use. Uh, MEMIF is more targeted for that kind of use case. So I have a sort of uh, <clears throat> comment to what you said at the very beginning, uh, that you were sending all the kudos to the uh, demonstration team doing the stuff before Frederick and the team. So I just wanted to, as Frederick is now in the, in the room, I think a big kudos goes to the, to the previous speakers uh, who did the demo, because yesterday was a very special day. The yesterday was the 50th anniversary of the demo of all demos by the um, Doug Engelbart who presented uh, web and mouse and few other things. So 50th anniversary yesterday and today seeing this demo, it was a, a beautiful way to, to celebrate the, the, the 50th anniversary. So really big kudos to the, to the team. Um, on, the, on the DPDK and VPP notes, um, you know, I've been, I have, haven't heard about DPDK um, before I started to work on FDIO and, uh, and VPP. And I have to say that um, Thanks to DPDK and, and you guys, uh, my faith got restored into fast networking on, on computers, and I, you know, really enjoying the uh, the collaboration. And uh, I absolutely love your visuals, which were much better than mine. So uh, you clearly know your stuff in terms of the hardware. Magic, is uh, there a question in there? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so about a year. About a year. So that was a warm up. Uh, about a year ago, we started to project this uh, very catchy name, technical marketing, you know, running terabit performance on the computer. Um, that's what we did uh, last year, and we did it for nick to nick okay? And we know how much we can drive from the socket. We just multiple sockets, we get a terabit. Sure, cool. What do you think, in your view, um, would take for the industry um, to get a terabit services um, out of the computer. So no nick to nick anymore, but actually those network functions that I talked about and you talked about. How far you, away you think we are? Um, well, I, I, 
Yes. One terabits per second from a single computer. I guess Lots of network functions. I don't want to be careful, but all, all I would say is that when I started working on networking for Intel all of 10 years ago, we at that time we had Nehalem. And on a typical Nehalem system, you get eight cores. You know, and at that point we were doing 10 gig. And I have watched things evolve now to the point where you know, typical systems have 20, generally have 20 plus cores. And on, in the aggregate on that system, between a BP system, you're talking about 40 cores. And you're talking about speeds from the 40 to 100 gig range, and typically plus now. So I see this ne inevitable progression where we get to those kind of speeds. It's a matter of core, and it's a matter of not, it's a matter of core, it's a matter of IO, and it will come in time. So when? <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> okay. So um, I understand that you also believe um, uh, in the Moore's law, rambling on, uh, from the I/O networking I/O perspectives, because Absolutely. if we just keep extending this curve, I think it's not that far so, away at know, all. The last ten years we've seen, you know, have very much demonstrably been Moore's law in action, and it's not only about cores; it's actually also improvements in IPC. You know, we had a contributor from Army earlier talking about, you know, the you know use of vector instructions in the R on the ARM microprocessors. And we see the same behaviors in Intel microprocessors where generation on generation, IPC gets faster, the number of IPC improves, the number of cores counts expands, and the amount of available I own the system also improves, and also the amount of the scalability of the I.O. fabric also improves over time. So, you know, and that's why I made the comment just a moment ago that I think it's, inev it's, it's, it's inevitable. But if you were to ask me for a specific date,